All right, what's up, Nadia? Hi, buddy. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. How are you? Good, good. Good. So, uh, what's been up with you? How's your day been? Oh, it's been nearly perfect, man. You remember that job I was telling you about? I do remember. I got it. What? I got the job. A leasing consultant. Yeah, 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 yeah. Awesome. <laughs> that is awesome. Yeah. I knew you were getting it all on, though. Yeah, I appreciate it, man. Yeah. The cake is wonderful. <laughs> that is awesome. So when do you start your job? Uh, I'll be starting March 11th, but Monday is my first day. I'll go in and pick out my new apartment because I'll be able to live on site, nice. which is really exciting. Um, it'll be the first time I ever have my own apartment. So wow. I know I'm a little old and I should have been at it, but expensive. We all got to start somewhere. That's <laughs> yeah. awesome, dude. Heck yeah. That's awesome. So uh, I think our last podcast, we kind of touched a little bit on your uh your past and your family life, but I want to go into deeper um, detail into that. So where are you from? So I was born here actually in Atlanta, uh, in Gwinnett County area. Um, I was raised here for a little while. I think my bio, my bio mom um, like stayed in this area. And then we ended up, I had a very traumatic childhood growing up. And so my mom was always be running away from DFACS or um, Department of Family and Children's Services. And so she was always on the run. So eventually, you know, they started looking for her to take us, me and my other two siblings away. And it turned into, you know, oh, we're gonna go down to Savannah. And we went to Savannah and then my bio mom went to jail for a little while. And then um, my aunt had custody of us while she was in jail. Um, and my aunt kept us down. How there. old were you at this age? Um, probably about six or seven. Okay. And I think we were with her for like like a year or so. With your aunt? Mm-hmm. Okay. And during that time, um, we were very poor. Um, they didn't have a lot. We didn't have a lot at all. We were always like in and out of the trailer or living out of the car or, you know, it just got, it was just kind of crazy, honestly. Um, and then my aunt started trying to find new ways to bring in money. Okay. Um, and the way that she found that was reconnecting with somebody that was a part of the sex trafficking ring here in Atlanta. Wow. Um, so it evolved into, you know, hey, if you let me do this to these kids, I'll give you this much money. And then it was kind of like a vicious cycle that went back and forth. Like every time she needed money, she would just pawn us off to this man. And so this was you and who else? Um, me and my uh, me in the beginning. Okay. It was just me, and then. And you were six years old, six or seven. Yeah, my um. So I started getting sexually assaulted by my biological mom's boyfriend at the time. So which would have been my stepdad, and that started when I was five. And then, you know, we started running, they started moving. They actually went to jail. When they went to jail, the lady that I called my aunt really wasn't my aunt. She was, um, she was the sister of the stepdad. Okay. Um, and so it kind of, it was kind of like just an ugly cycle mm -hmm. of like abuse that was just going around. But ultimately it started at five and it didn't end until I was like 16. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was crazy, but it was like they needed money. And then when my biological mom got out of jail, uh -huh. you know, she was looking for money. She needed money. She needed it quick. And um, she was also a really hardcore drug addict. So it was, it was really rough. I mean, it was really rough. Um, so she got out of jail and then, you know, I guess my aunt, at the time introduced her to the guy who was already sexually abusing us uh, and um you know they kind of made their own deal okay well i'll make the same deal with you and it was it was really hard um my biological mom wouldn't go for the first couple of times she always just let the aunt do all the all of it you know it was it was kind of uh traumatic because we would my aunt would come pick us up from wherever we were M most of the time it was just me in the beginning it was just me because i was a little bit older um, and she would come pick me up and take me to this man's house and she would bathe me in the tub and then like get me prepared. And then sometimes they would give me drugs, like, I don't know what kind of drugs, but, um, it would make me like conscious. So I was there and I knew what was going on, but I couldn't like pick up my arms or like lift my legs or like move or like even say anything or scream or anything. So it was kind of like one of those things that was just 
kind of, I remember everything, but I like couldn't do anything. And then uh, it would be over and they would get money and we would, they would take us shopping and, you know, kind of uh, bribe us, you know, don't tell, you know, this is normal. Like, you know, you did very good and stuff like that. And then, you know, eventually it turned into um, different men. So they, they would find different men that want to do the same thing. Uh -huh. um, and sexually abused and in exchange they would get money or drugs or you know a place to live or whatever the case may be um and so then that just continued so then i basically got sold into the sex trafficking ring um so now it's gotten bigger than just your mom and your aunt now it's a yeah, whole bunch of people it was a whole community okay um and it's crazy how many sick individuals are actually out there that like i don't know it's just it's kind of crazy how many sick people are out there and are okay with um, things like that happening, and that's kind of you know what what um, arouses them, which is bizarre to me. Yeah. So then it turned into bigger. Um, once you got into a bigger community, um, my stepdad had got out of prison at that time. So this is like two years later. I'm about um, eight or nine. Um, and my stepdad got out and so he was hurting me and molesting me at home and like beating me like both my mom and my stepdad and my aunt used to just beat us really bad um, they would beat us with whatever they could get their hands on whether it be a piece of wood or they sometimes they had this big leather belt that was really thick leather belt and they would soak it in water and then beat us with it oh and then uh, I'll never forget one time I got pneumonia yeah. and I couldn't breathe and I, I, I was a, I was a young kid I was like nine I think eight or nine something like that and I couldn't breathe and I went into my mom's room and I just remember trying to speak to her but I couldn't because I couldn't breathe and my lips were turning purple and I was like having that staticky vision in my head and I remember like you know they were like oh she really can't breathe like you have to go to the hospital and instead of you know calling the ambulance to come pick me up they put me in the car themselves, and I'll, I'll never forget it. The last thing my stepdad said is, oh, bring me back something to drink when you come home. Like, not, oh, I hope you're okay. I hope she lives. You know, everything's going to be all right. It was nothing of that nature. And um, I think that was one of the, one one thing that was really traumatizing, I guess. Yeah. But um, so we finally go to the hospital, and, you know, they told me, oh, you have pneumonia and stuff. And then DCF was notified at that point. Okay. And so we end up having to move to, to Savannah again. So then we moved down there and we stayed. Um, a lot of things happened in between that if I just told you, we'd be here for days. Yeah. <laughs> so we moved to Savannah and at the time it was my biological mother, um, my stepdad, um, his sister, which would have been the aunt, um, my grandmother, which was my biological mother's mother. Okay. And then my me and my two siblings, so six of us all together. Gotcha. Um, and we lived down in Savannah, all over Savannah, Georgia, all over it. We stayed in a really nice house sometimes. Other times we were in, you know, really crappy houses where there's no electricity, no running water, like feces and stuff in the tub, and like that's just how we had to live. Um, we were very much those little trailer park kids running around barefoot in the <laughs> with ringworm on our feet. <laughs> and meanwhile, all the time this is going on, like your parents are doing drugs as well. Yeah, they're doing drugs. My mom was a hardcore crackhead, very hardcore, very intense. Um, she, I loved her. I still love her. I, I, it's hard for me. I've I found ways to forgive her um, through God. You know, honestly. Like I mentioned before, I've always felt like I had the presence of God with me throughout all of this. I never really understood what was going on, and that's where kind of my animosity came from with God. And over the years, I would find myself, oh, I really love God, and He's looking out for me. And then other times, I'd be so confused because I was like, why is this happening? You know, I mean, and I went through a lot of torturous things, like, I mean, getting raped, you know, front and back, and, you know, just having to deal with getting whooped and beaten it was it was very as hard. you were a child yeah being a freaking child and i remember the first time i ever told my biological mom that my stepdad was hurting me and um 
if I remember it like it was yesterday, but she, she basically called me a liar. Um, she had me come in the room and sit across from my stepdad. They put up a pillow and was like, well, if he's really doing this to you, describe his parts. And when I couldn't, because obviously as a child, you want to keep your eyes closed because you don't like what's going on. Yeah. I couldn't do it. They locked me in a, they locked me in the back room for three or four days with a trash can and like locked me in there and then would come in every other day or every day and just beat the shit out of me. Sorry for my language. <laughs> if I, I believe me, I'd be cussing too if it happened to me. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was crazy. So ultimately, so you'd say, ultimately, like what led up to their capture and their arrest? Like, how'd you get out of it? So honestly, I really have my, um, my youngest sister to thank for that one. She was the really strong one out of all of us. Um, so it, you want to fast forward, I was about 11 years old. Um, and my biological mother was with another man. She, uh, the stepdad had ended up going to prison a couple years before that. Um, and she got with this new guy and this new guy was very abusive as well. He would, you know, rape us and beat us too and torture us, um, when she wasn't home. And then when she would come home, he would like beat on her too. And then one day, uh, he ended up slicing her arm open with a knife and, um, it was in that moment that I like ran across the apartment complex and was banging on the door like, my mommy's bleeding, like call the police, call the police. And so finally the police came out there and came to the house and stuff. And um, I remember like the police asked me like, is anyone hurting y'all or anything? And, I, and all I could think in my head was if I do this and I get taken away from my mom and I won't see my siblings anymore. And right. like, it's gonna be traumatic, but um, it ended up coming out. My, my little sister was very brave and bold and basically said, Hey, like, I just want you to know all of this is going on here. We don't eat very often and <laughs> we don't have a lot of food. And, you know, it was crazy. Like growing up, we would get bags of chips. There's three of us, me and my two sisters, and we'd sit. Each one of us get one chip one chip so that way we divided up the bag evenly and everybody had you know the right amount and if it came down to that last chip we'd split it in three and make sure all of us got it and that's how we would eat food um a lot of times like i'd find us going through the garbage and you know asking neighbors like oh can we have some food or trying to go to our friend's house and like eat their food and sneak i remember just sneaking food all the time i'd be sticking food in places and going to the gas stations and just trying to like get as much food as i can and uh, so my sister ended up telling the police that, and then they ended up taking us into a protective care um, that day, actually. Um, so they put they placed us with family friends um, while they continued to do an investigation. And then once they did the investigation, they were like, "Wow, like this is kind of like really messed up." So we ended up not going back to my biological mom, and we went into some group homes. Um, and then from there, it just kind of it didn't get better. It was better than getting beat every day. Right. So I can say that like, it, it got better on that aspect, but it was very hard. Um, it was very like they, they, for the most part, they always kept me and my sisters together. They never separated us. That's good. Um, and we moved from foster care, foster care, foster care, foster care, different homes, different group homes. Um, if it wasn't one of us misbehaving, it was the other one. You know, two of us would like to hear that the third one would hate it or, you know, vice versa or whatever. So we we kind of like learned the system. Like if one of us doesn't like it and we all act up, they'll move us. Yeah. You know what I mean? So <laughs> we figured it out, you know, and then after a while we went into this one group home or we went into this one foster home after coming out of a group home. And we were at that foster home for two years, which was the longest place we'd ever lived in our entire lives. Mm -hmm. We'd never been in one place for longer than a month. So we were there, we got really attached, and that's where I had my first experience going to middle school and elementary school and making friends and just being a part of the community. It was like, oh wow, this is normal. And then I started going, to, you start learning in school, like good touch, bad touch, and you're like, oh, like this isn't normal. Like kids aren't experiencing this. This isn't how life's supposed to be. And so um, ultimately it would turn into me like telling my counselors at school like oh well this did happen to me like you know what I mean and then um so like I was able to open up and and learn in those times that like you know stuff that was happening wasn't normal um and then then I remember one day it happened so fast it happened in a week um 
mind you, we had been out of this foster home for two years. Okay. Well, DCF, uh, Department of Family and Children's Services, lost our case. So we were in foster care for like five years. Oh, wow. And they had lost our case. They had, they forgot that we were even in the foster home that we were in. Really? Yeah. And so um, when they end up discovering our case and discovering that these three kids have been sitting in this foster home for so, so long. So they just completely forgot you were in the system. Yeah. And y'all were... So there was a big flood that happened uh -huh. and back in that time, you know, we didn't, we weren't reliant on computers as much as we are right, now. Right. So they had a big flood and it flooded and ruined all of the paperwork and stuff. So then they, you know, they didn't have any record of it. Right. Um, so then it boiled down to like, you know, we, we, the foster families reached out to the DCF and we're like, I still have these three kids. Like, what are we doing? We're not adopting them. Um, you know, they wanted to pursue adopting the youngest child that came in, which was like a little baby boy. And he came in from a different home. He wasn't related to us, but uh, he ended up coming in. And it was kind of like one of those things where it was like, once they saw that baby, they wanted that baby and they wanted the rest of the kids gone. Yeah. Um, and so then they were like pushing like, you know, are you getting these kids out? Are you getting these kids out? And so then it turned into, there was this family, um, I call it, they're the Smith family. And it was a, a husband and wife um, who literally came from Cairo, Georgia. And they came up and they were like, we really want to adopt these three kids. Like, we would give them a good home and stuff. And it seemed like a picture perfect. I hated them from the get-go. Really? I didn't, I wasn't about it. Um, I didn't trust them. I, I had an icky feeling about them. Um, the mom was very sweet uh, in the beginning. She was very sweet. But later I would discover that she's very much crazy and narcissistic and just really mean. Um, they never hit us. Okay. But the adoptive dad did abuse us a lot. Like verbal abuse? Verbally sexually. and sexually. Oh, wow. Again, and, it's yeah. like you just get out of it and then you're, what the heck, Back in man? It. So, um, and so. With your sisters as well? It happened to them later on. Okay. Um, their story goes a little bit further with them because when when my when the foster dad started doing that to me, I had just moved and I had just turned fourteen years old. We had just celebrated my birthday at that November, um, November and December. You know, it was good. It was easy. Nothing unregular. Uh, he would buy like packs of underwear and be like, "Oh, go try these on. Let me see them. Let me make sure they fit you." And at the time. You're still a kid and you're like, oh, okay, well, this is normal because he's not actually doing anything right. to me. You know what I mean? Um, and so then it turned into that and then it turned into like him actually abusing me and sexually assaulting me. And and I know he would do it when the wife would go to sleep. So he would come in there after she would go to sleep. And then I started sneaking out of the window because okay. I was like, okay, like I know he's going to come in here at nighttime. As long as I'm back before the morning, like they're not going to say anything. Yeah. Um, and then, so I started doing that and this was about three months, months into living with them. So on one of the nights I snuck out, well, that happened to be the same night. She just got up out of the bed and was just, like checking on us and she noticed I wasn't in the bed and I would run, like I would run away, but I wouldn't go far. Like we lived behind a big, like we were in the woods. So there was a bunch of woods and then I had this friend and um, I would go back behind there and I would just sit at a tree with my blanket and my teddy bear and we would just sit there and I knew when the sun started coming up because it would start getting light so I'd go back. Um, <clears throat> well this morning I went back, there was a bunch of police there, they were looking for me and um, the foster mom had told the police that I was out doing drugs and I snuck out to a party and that I was just being bad and I was being a bad influence. And then they ended up, the police ended up taking me that night um, because I was in foster care in Savannah, which is hours away. My caseworker wasn't available to come pick me up. Okay. So I ended up get, going in handcuffs for the first time, going to um, an adult jail where they stuck me in a cell. And it was... But they didn't really have proof that you did anything. They just yeah, went off of what your... What the foster mom had said. Okay. And um, when the caseworker got there, she asked me, you know, why did you sneak out? You know, you're not supposed to do that. And I told them, like, hey, it's because this foster dad's doing things to me, like, and, like, no one believes me. And then at that point, it turned into, oh, no, this child's just trying to get attention. She's trying to get out of the house. She's going to disrupt the house with her siblings in it, so we need to separate her. Oh, man. 
So then that was when we got separated from my from my sisters for the first time. And then I went into a group home and I didn't get to see my sisters or like be able to like talk to them or like anything. It was it was really heartbreaking. Um but I miss them a lot and so then over the I was in the group homes after that ever since then. Um and I just like it hurts because I like to this day like I I feel like I missed out on so much of my siblings life and um, I just wish that I would have been able to stick it out and stay with them kind of deal so I ended up going into these group homes and getting a lot of counseling and then my my first group home you know I you could only be there for a certain amount of time and then I got moved to a a group home where I could be at longer and then I ended up building this fast trust I was doing really good there um, ultimately like I'd be told like hey like if you do really good this week then you'll be able to see your family and like you'll be able to see your siblings and stuff and um, it was it was encouraging because I thought I would be able to see them but it was heartbreaking when I would get that call and be like actually they're not able to come yeah. And then you're not able to see them. And then you just feel like all the work you just did was for nothing. You know what I mean? And so one of those days, I uh, built the staff's trust there enough that I would go into the kitchen and, you know, I would help clean and, you know, do whatever. And at this point, I was like a preteen, you know, I was 14, 15 years old. So they would let me go up to the kitchen. Well, one of the days I was in the kitchen, I was like, you know what, after here, like I'm running away. Mm -hmm. And so I ran away. And, um, that was a wild day, man. I remember hopping over fences. The police were running after me. What, you were 16, 17? I was, I was 15. 15, okay. Yeah. And um, I had, like, you know, helicopters over what? me. What? Yeah, it was crazy. So, um, I... I a true rebel at 15. Yeah. <laughs> man. But, um, ultimately, like, I ran away, and then I ended up, like... Obviously, I'm a kid, so I didn't really know what to do. So, I went knocking on some random lady's door. And I was like, hey, like, I, I just need some water and some food. Like, do you have any? And then she ended up calling the police saying, hey, like, this random girl just showed up to my house. Like, and so then they ended up coming to get me. And then they took me even further away from where my siblings were. And so then I ended up in Columbus, Georgia, in a group home. And that's where I stayed uh, most of the time. I'll never forget it. There was this, my counselor who was at the previous group home, the one that I ran away from. Um, her name was Miss Sheila and she was a wonderful woman, but she came up to my group home and she was like, Hey, like me and my family want to adopt you. Like we love you and we want you here. But I ended up saying no, because I knew that I could go back home with my siblings. And that's ultimately where I wanted to go because I knew that nobody was going to believe them and the stuff that was going on with them. And I knew what was going on because it was happening to me. So I was like, no, I can't do that. And, um, Sometimes I very much wish that I would have went with that family because I really love them too, but I couldn't be without my siblings. And I was ultimately like trying to go back to them. And um, so some years go by, I'm about to turn, I think I, I just turned 16. Um, and finally the foster family ended up coming back and they came and got me and they got me okay. out of the group home. And so I was reunited with one of my sisters. Okay. But they had put the the youngest one of my sisters in uh, a group home, in a mental facility. Oh wow! Um, it's I think to this day it's like number three like mental facility in the world in the world. It's where they send all the crazy like murder people that like don't have like they can't charge them because they're mentally ill. Right. And so they put her in there, and she was like twelve, I think twelve or thirteen, and um, so I was reunited with one of them, and then. You know, we had a really fun summer. Um, I got to spend a lot of time with my sister and it was just really good. Um, that was the same year that I ended up meeting my biological sister. Okay. So that was really cool. I got to meet her and um, and then they end up getting my little sister out of the group home. And so all of us re were reunited um, for like a couple of months. And then one day in the middle of the night, um, the foster mom and the dad were like, okay, like we're actually gonna be moving to Washington State. Well, you need to pack one suitcase, you need one stuffed animal, and we bought this camper and we're gonna live in this camper and travel across the country. 
And it sounded like a lot of fun, but when you like really think about it. As a kid, yeah, it does sound like fun. And yeah. You know, being 15, 16 years old, that sounds fun. Yeah, but you realize like what is about to happen. You know oh, what yeah. I mean? Like in my head, okay, we're, we're always going to be together. So like I thought I was safe. Like, okay, the foster dad wouldn't be molesting me anymore. He wouldn't be able to hurt my sister. So right. Like, maybe this is a good thing. Right. Um, and it ended up not. Uh, the foster mom would go off to work because she, she was a traveling nurse. So she would go off to her job and her contracts throughout the day. And then the foster dad would do whatever he wanted to. Oh, um, man. So then it turned into just like, I don't know, like during that time, um, I think they were like really just trying to like marry me off to get me out because they were always encouraging me to like have boyfriends, go get married, like go have sex, like this is normal. And um, at the time, like I was like, okay, you know, like this is cool. But then as time goes on, we finally made it to Washington and I told the foster mom what was going on. And at this time I was like 17. And um, did she believe you? No, she didn't. She she thought again I was just making it up, and so she ended up telling me to like get out of the house and kick me out. And um, yeah, your sister stayed there. Yeah, they got to stay there. It is, it's really hard to talk about because it that was a. Yeah. It, hey, it's. A, don't talk about it. It's all good. Yeah, it was uh, just really hard being yeah. separated from them again, and yeah. then not knowing when I was going to see them again, and like be yeah. able to talk to them and stuff. So I ended up getting a ticket to Florida um, when I was like seventeen, and I stayed with this lady. Her name was Valerie. Yeah. She is my angel. <laughs> that that woman is my angel. She protected me. She gave me a house over my head. She loved me. She took me to church. She exposed me up to all the good things. She celebrated my 18th birthday with me. She just showed me what true love was and in such a pure way. She's she's just an angel. She's a good woman. Um, and she kind of taught me how to be a woman. Like she, she taught me how to like respect myself and you know, you don't have to be dating all these people to feel loved and you're loved. And so I stayed with her until I was about 19. I think, or a little before I was 19, and then I ended up moving out, um, and I moved out, and I, I just, I went to Jacksonville, Florida, and I got married at a really young age, and it was just basically for an agreement, like, you give me a place to live, I'll marry you, you get benefits, you know what I mean, like, it worked out, um, he was freaking crazy, he was crazy, and he was a, he was a hardcore coke addict. So um, at the time, he just wasn't mentally fit either. So I, um, I ended up leaving his house and um, I ended up getting into a relationship with another guy who I was with for like three years and it was just really abusive. He would beat me like really bad, like lock me in the closets and control what I could eat and when I could eat. And he'd always have a camera on me to watch every move that I did. And like he broke my ribs, he broke my eye, like it was, it was really traumatic and I lost relationships with people because like I was so, he isolated me so much and I didn't have a phone or anything like that. And then, um, one day I, I had these, I had a team of people. Um, it was these people that worked at a law firm and they were basically stood behind me. It was like, Hey, like this stuff is not normal. And like, you need to get out of it. Like, this is not normal. You need to figure yourself out. Um, I tried to commit suicide like a couple of times. I was in, I was Baker acted. I took a bunch of pills multiple times, just trying to die and like trying to get out of the world because I just, I just felt so lonely and like, like I wasn't worthy enough of love and that's why no one could love me. Um, and so these people came in and they just like rescued me and basically was like, let me into their home and, and around their family. And they showed me that they trusted me and that they wanted better things for me. And I mean, to this day, I can call them and be like, Hey, and they're like, Hey, like this is our adoptive daughter. <laughs> and, um, they really like, they were the first people besides Valerie to like really take me in and love me, like love me unconditionally and teach me and like want me to be better and want me to do good. And, um, you know, they started taking me to church and I'd go to church with them and they bought me my very first Bible that I had ever had. And um, it was just really cool. And so then it was in that time I started like picking myself up and like started evolving. Um, I worked, you know, I started working jobs and 
you know, I did bounce around a lot and it was, it was a lot. It really, it really was a lot. Um, at this time I still hadn't had any contact with my siblings. I hadn't talked to them. Um, and then on a random day, I remember my youngest sister reaching out like, Hey, like, I know you don't want to talk to us, but like, we miss you. And like, this is what's going on in our house. And, and what age were you? I, I was about 20 years old, okay. 21. Um, so not even that long ago, like seven years ago. Yeah. Um, but she reached out to me and she said all this and it turns out that the foster mom had left the husband. Okay. And she had left the husband and left the girls there with him. And I'm assuming she left the husband because she found out what was going on. Yeah, and I think he was just very abusive to her as well. Okay. And so finally, you know, they reached out and they're like, hey, this is what's going on in our house. So I hadn't spoken to her since I left, since I was 17. And I, I, I found a way to contact her. I contacted her and I said, hey, I just, I want you to know this is what's going on in this house. And I know that you didn't believe me, but they have proof that this is what's going on. And so then it turned into, you know, she going to go get them. And she, I guess she did go get them. And he ended up going to jail. And he's in jail now. He's in jail. Um, so that ended for them. But then the girls went back with them and... Unfortunately for my youngest sister, she was just really bad off. Um, they didn't set her up for success, and he had gotten her addicted to drugs really bad. So he would exchange sex for drugs. He'd be like, hey, you know, you do this to me, I'll give you this. And this will make you feel good. You know what I mean? So then it turned into that. And then, um, so then the little si my little sister got kicked out. She kicked her out. Um, and she's been on her own ever since then. And then shortly after that, my other sister ended up, uh, the same thing happened to her. The, you know, they, she, the, the adopted mom pawned her off on another person. It was like, hey, like, you know, go stay with them, whatever. And so that's what she did. And my little sister, like, she's a freaking trooper, man. I wish I had the strength that she does because she's so strong and I admire her. Even though she's younger than me, she's been, like, she, she's just so, like, smart and intelligent in so many different ways. Um, so she ended up like saving up all her money working and then she ended up getting her own place and now she's doing wonderful. She's, she's, she's doing just absolutely exceptional and beautiful. So are you super close to both of them right now? Um, I try to be, I really do, but. Is there still like some tension between? I think I will always carry guilt in my heart. I mean, just thinking about it makes me emotional because I just. Like, I know that I missed out on so much of their life. Yeah. And it's kind of like one of those things that couldn't be prepared. And then we end up all just being very different people. Like, I'm a very trippy, hippie, like, yeah. go with the flow, kind of like never make plans, but just go with it. Yeah. And then the other one's like, no, we got to have plans. We got to do it by this way. We got to do it this, that way. And then the last one, she's just, she's struggling on her own. Um, you know, she, she struggles with addiction and drugs and, you know. That's what I was going to ask you. Were they both able to kick the drugs or are they still struggling? My one them? sister did. She's never done any drugs. Um, she saw what it did to the world and she was like, mm -mm, don't want to be a part of that. Um, she was actually the very first one to graduate nice. from high school with a high school diploma out of all of us, out of the entire family. So that was a moment I was really proud of her. Um, she lives far away, so <laughs> I don't get to see her that often. But the other one is... Um, she, she still struggles with drugs and is just trying to find a way in life. And, you know, I don't really talk to her much because of the fact that it is, um, she is so lost that like when she reaches out, it's just for like money or right. like, can you do this, can you right. do that? And it's like, I'm not in a place to like help anyone, you know what yeah. I mean? Like I'm still trying to pick myself up. Right. And uh, so I guess through all of this, it's, been a struggle of like feeling guilty and you know not having shame for not being there for my siblings and like loving them so much and just not being able to give them what they needed and so um but i mean at the same time you were a child yourself like you were trying to make it so i can understand where you feel guilty but i mean you shouldn't because there was nothing you could do you're you're Real um, mom and dad, they're still in prison right now. Yeah, they're still in prison. They won't get out for a little while. Um, Weren't they on America's Most Wanted or something? Yeah, my biological mom was on America's Most Wanted. That's actually how she got captured. Okay. Um, they aired her show 
it was the last season and I think it was like episode 56 or something like that but they basically walked they did a whole episode on our story and like what happened and you know there was three of them the aunt was wanted um the stepdad was wanted and then my biological mom was wanted the stepdad ended up um he ended up fleeing to a different country so they never found him they still haven't found him mm -mm. wow and um the aunt ended up getting captured and I testified against her I think it was back in 2024 or so you saw her face to face 2014 yeah wow yeah that was a it was very traumatic um so yeah we testified against her and she went to prison and then my biological mother was captured because a neighbor was watching the episode and recognized her oh and called oh my gosh are you and said serious? hey like I just want you to know this person that's on TV right now lives right beside me Wow. And so then she got captured. Um, and same she, day, like the same day she called the yeah, cops. They busted in, and um, and I have three younger siblings. Um, I've never met them, or I think they got adopted or something like that. But I never got to meet them or anything. But really? They're out there. And their blood. Yeah, like, biological mom. And you've never met them. Mm -mm. Wow. But um, yeah, it's kind of like one of those things that it's. It's a story that's like you can't even really process that all that's happened. You know what I mean? Yeah, you're a tough, you're a tough cookie. That is for sure. Um, but I wouldn't have been able to do it without the power of God through me. Absolutely. Through that whole thing. Absolutely. So you just got saved not too well. I'm not gonna say you got saved. You just got baptized not too long ago. Yeah, I did back in December 17th or December 17th, 2023. I got baptized, and it was it was really weird. Um, like. Over last June, I had my first experience where God actually sent. I, I will, I will fight and argue with anyone that it wasn't an angel, but it was an angel. Like it was an angel, and I was standing at this cross, and I was in North Carolina, and I was just praying, and I, um, I just went to this music festival, and I just met this like these amazing people that like just changed changed my perspective on life, and like showed me love, and then I, I remember it was like first time I'd actually like really cried and like you know people around me were like it's okay to cry like yeah. you know like that's okay like right. release it like let it go and um and then I met I met my partner and it was just like I didn't really believe in a like I was single for a really long four years I was single and so I didn't believe that a man could actually come in and like love me properly and like guide me and like you know not hurt me and abuse me and right and I met him it was just like game over you know what i mean yeah. and then i met some beautiful friends and i mean they're my best friends now i'll argue all day that they're my family <laughs> like try to tell me otherwise yeah. um and so i started meeting them and then i left and i was just feeling so full and thankful and grateful and like i do want to go to school i do want to go to college like i want to um i want to do something more with my life like this is what i, I need this i need something more than just working these little part-time jobs and struggling and not knowing how I'm gonna do this or do that. So I remember just being at this cross and just praying like, God, like whatever you want me to do, like make it very clear, make a way for me. And I was listening to the music and uh, something in my head just said, turn off the music, turn off the music and just listen to what's around you. And the moment I did that, I heard someone playing the, the acoustic guitar and it was a gospel song. I don't know what gospel song it was. I don't I don't know where it was coming from. All I heard it, I heard it for a few minutes and then it went off and it just stopped. And so I was like, okay, well that was that was beautiful. Okay, time to go back. Let's go home. Yeah. Um, and when I turned around, there's this couple standing there. And um, her name was Miss Jeanette, and uh, they're the men's family. A really nice couple um, and they were like trying to take a picture in front of the cross and I was like I walked up I was like hey let me take that picture for you I got you like I'll make sure it looks really nice and so we stood there and I shared a little bit of my story with her and I was just like hey like and she was she's asking me like have you ever went to college like you know where do you work where do you live like how's your life and stuff like that and um, I, I shared a little bit of my and it was the first time I'd ever really been honest with anyone. Like, you know, yeah, I didn't finish school or in, and just like kind of like, it was a stranger. So I was like, no, oh, you know, what, what's the truth gonna hurt here? You know right. what I mean? So I was very honest with it and very, very upfront. And then, you know, she got my number and she was like, hey, like I want you to do some crafting for me. And so I did, and then I, you know, I mailed it to her. And then a couple of days later, her she calls me and she's like, hey, like 
I think you're an exceptional human being and like I just want to see you grow and be more and I want to step your, you up for success. Uh -huh. So she was like, me and my husband would like to pay for you to go to college on a full ride. What? Yeah. So, and that was a moment that I, like in my head I said, well, well God heard me. Like this is God's work. Like right. this is God did this. I didn't do this. Right. And um, so yeah, they are you know currently like helping me get through school and helping me financially through that. Um, that is amazing. So once you pass this test, then you can go on and go to um, yeah, college. college. Yeah. So we get through um, getting through that, and then. Here's, here's what's even more crazy, and this is how I know that it was God, without a doubt in my heart. When I was when I was about 12 years old, I was in a group home, and I'd never read a chapter book ever, um, unless it was like in school or something, you know? But this book in particular, I read by myself. Um, it was a book called Glass Castle by Jeanette Wells, okay. and it was basically a book about this girl who had a very broken lifestyle as a kid, grew up very poor, like her family were like... Um, you know, they lived homeless all the time and they just were okay with that. Never, like, they just had a really tough upbringing. Um, and the author of the book was Jeanette. The lady that I met at the cross that day, her name was Miss Jeanette. Wow. And so that was like God's way of like clearly speaking to me. Like, yeah. what are the odds? Right. I've never met anyone named that or even came close to that name ever yeah. until this moment today. Right. You know what I mean? So it was it was very like moment of like wow God is like actively in my life and then from then on I just felt his presence around me all the time. And um I went through like a really like after that I struggled. Like there was like two months where I got seriously depressed because I was like, Well, like I don't understand this, I'm not living life the right way. I remember me and my boyfriend were I was giving him such a hard time because I was like trying to push him away because I was like, Oh if he truly loves me, you know, like he'll stay but then it just ended up, you know, me, like, I didn't mistreat him, but I was definitely really hard to love. I made myself really hard to love. And so, um, you know, it came to a point where he was like, listen, like, I can't do this. I love you and I want to be with you, but, like, you have to understand I'm not going anywhere. But right. if you keep, you know, pushing me away, like, I'm not going to be able to tolerate it. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, like, I really love this person. Like, I need to change my ways. I need to be better. I need to be healthier. So I started going to therapy and... Um, just kind of like trying to find my way through that and I did and I really feel like ever since then I've like grown a lot in my relationship um, he, he tells me every day like I'm so proud of you and how far you've come like you're coming so far so um, our relationship got healthier and better and um, there's still like this little wounded child inside of me that sometimes just gets like you know like a push but then like I, I found a way to like check myself where I'm like no like I really love this person I don't want to lose this person um and so over this this past year you know I've been growing and growing and growing and it was one of the weekends that I was driving up to see your wife and you and um you know I just randomly asked her like oh like does your church do baptisms like I want to get baptized and I've been feeling like God was with me this whole time and but I just felt so heavy and I felt like, I just felt like all of my past was with me and that it was never gonna go away. And I just carried so much guilt for like not being with my siblings and not being a good kid or, you know, like doing whatever I was partying and drinking all the time and just like losing myself and not knowing who I was. And so it's like being in my relationship and like having someone healthy, I was like, no, I wanna be better. Um, and then the people in my life, I just started meeting really good people. I'm like, no, I want to be like these people. I want to be successful. I want, I want the things that they have. Um, and so I started talking to Mandy about, you know, baptism and, and she told me, she was like, you get baptized. It's like, everything gets washed away. You're yeah. washed and yeah. you're cleansed. And you know, all of those bad things that were attached to you are no more because you, you're reborn. Mm -hmm. You're reborn that day. Um, and so I ended up, you know, coming to church that Sunday with you guys and then, um, reaching out to them and be like, Hey, like, I, I want to get baptized. Um, and so it was like a week later, they're like, okay, like, let's come in and let's, let's get you baptized. And I did. And I just feel like that day is very emotional too. It was like one of the happiest days of my life because I knew, 
I knew in my heart that like God was with me and God loved me and the things that were happening weren't because of him, it was right. because of, you know, the devil being released upon the earth and him having a hold of all these people that were around. Um, and I knew in that moment that I had a light inside of me that could empower other people, you know what I mean? And with his love and with his mercy, I'm able to shine that light. Um, so I got baptized and um, I noticed things got a little rocky after I got baptized, but I feel like that was kind of like the devil's way of like pushing at me and be like, oh, you know, like yeah. things are great over here, yeah. but it's like really not, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so um, it was a little hard at first and then it, I kind of like managed it and I just got really deep into my Bible. If I, you know, I started worrying and even now I start worrying, I'm like, nope, God's got it. You know, I mean, I start getting anxiety. I'm like, nope, God's got it. You know, um, me and my partner have such a, we have a good communication where like, you know, a lot of the times, again, I still have that wounded child. I mean, so I find myself getting like uh, animosity, but I'm like, oh no, like this isn't, this isn't it. Like, this isn't what I want to be. I want to be like God. I want to be like Jesus. I want to love hard and turn the other cheek. And I don't want to be what other people are. You know what I mean? And I don't want the devil to use me no more. Like, I'm done with that. Right. And um, so, fast forward, uh, here we are in March, and um, I have just felt my life change dramatically since then with the power of God and, and just the strength of my friends and my family all around me and supporting me, and it's just truly magical. Um, and now I got this new job opportunity. It's like one door has opened up after another. It is definitely crazy how we're just from the last couple of weeks to now. Yeah. Just seeing all the events that have taken place and like connecting them all. It's like God's hand was on you the whole time. And yeah. you don't even realize it until today. <laughs> it's crazy how it works, you know. And I, I kind of wanted to, I mean, your story is freaking insane. You've been through so much and... You know, I know there's so many people you could help with your testimony, but I did want to ask, you know, what, what do you say to people out there who are going through the same thing that, you know, they don't want to be in this? What, what do they need to do? What should they do? How do they get out of it? Um, honestly, what, and they don't know Jesus like you did. Like, what if they don't know Jesus? How, how do they need to go about it? I would, I think, I think it's a, I think that Jesus lives within everyone. You know what I mean? Um, I just feel like our light gets dim to the point that we can't see it. Um, that's why I stay, stay shiny, stay shiny. You know what I mean? Um, because even when we don't think that it's inside of us and we have the strength to go on, we do. And it's a mind over matter. Um, I would say the first Bible scripture that I ever read and ever heard of um, was uh, Second Ephesians, the full body armor of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were just talking about it this morning. Yeah, and um, I think that was one of the ones that I read, and I was like, okay, well, there's a spiritual realm that we can't see, mm -hmm. and that's what's attacking us. Right. Um, you know, and it's going on all around us, and we just don't see it because we're, we can't see it, you know? Right. So when I first read that Bible scripture, you know, it talks about putting the chest plate of righteousness on, being your feet planted firm mm -hmm. with faith and taking up the sword and, you know, just having this full armor around you. And so I say, like, read that. Start there. Just read that. Read it every single day. You know what I mean? Read it until you believe it, mm -hmm. you know? And then once you start doing that, you know, I say if you don't know who God is, um, Maybe church is not for everyone. I know a lot of friends that don't go to church because they feel like there's a bunch of hypocrites in there, which is very true, you know, yeah, there's yeah, a lot. Yeah. Um, but I would just say, you know, find people that are good folks in your life that are religious Yeah. and ask them questions. Yeah, I mean, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. It says where one or more are gathered or two or more are gathered, you know. The church is a Yeah, lot. so, you know, a church is definitely a great thing and a good thing, um, you know, and you should go if you can, I believe. But you don't have to to be a Christian. I mm -hmm. mean, and also with the technology we have, all you have to do is cut on your computer. I mean, if you want to hear the word, you are able to hear the word in 2024. There's no, you know, you can you can definitely hear the word. Um, it's very um, energizing too. You know what I mean? Like I've never, 
like even before I really knew who God was, I would watch videos and I'd find myself getting pumped up like, yeah, this feels great. Like, where the heck is this energy coming from? You know what I mean? Yeah. And you, you find yourself like getting pumped and you find yourself, you know, if you ever hear that little voice in your head and it's telling you, you know, do good or do this or do that, it's kind of like one of those things where you, you, you know that that's Jesus talking to you. Whether you want to put two and two together, that's God. Right. You know, um, and that little voice, you know, when you when you start doing something you're not supposed to be doing and you start getting that feeling, that's God. Yeah. In your heart because you're not supposed to be doing that. You know what I mean? Right. Um, but, you know, someone just recently told me, God doesn't want you to feel guilt either. Right. You know what I mean? We're not supposed to feel guilty. So if you feel guilty, um, I mean, I, I hear people more oftentimes than not say, oh, the devil's real. The devil is a lie. You know what I mean? But then they don't have faith in Jesus. It's like, how can you believe in evil but not believe in good? Right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And and my number one thing is, if anybody doesn't take anything from this, do take this away. What do you have to lose? If you have faith, what do you have to lose? If you die and there is no heaven, you don't have anything to lose. Right. But if you die and there is a heaven, you have everything to lose. Yeah. And the Bible only wants you to it gives you a it gives you a walking way through life of how to do the right thing how to be a better person how to create you know bad situations turn them good like the bible is full of stories of people who were sinners people who did murders and hurt and hurt each other and all kinds of stuff but then at the end of it it shows how they turn their life around and how evil doesn't always have to be evil evil can be good and it can empower people you yeah know what i mean yeah. and so i just say that to everyone i'm like listen like what do you have to lose yeah. You don't have anything to lose. Yeah, yeah. I mean, God wants the God wants the drug addicts, and He wants the the rapists, and He wants the murderers. He wants those people because those people can go out and spread the word to other people who are in that situation. You know, so yeah. Everybody thinks you have to like have your act together to come to Jesus, but it's the complete opposite. You don't have to have your act together before you come to Jesus. You come to Jesus, and then your act gets turned around and it all doesn't happen at once you know everybody thinks that like oh you're a christian you know you you do things the right way you're perfect well that's the complete opposite you're still just a regular human being but you have jesus so you know right from wrong and you just do the best you can and you are judged a little bit more on what i have to say but you know that should show you that you should try to be more of a light to others um and you know i've also wanted to ask you and this could you know for, say for some instance, whenever your your mom and dad get out and they happen to watch this video, what would you have to say to them? Um, As you in your life right now, how good you're doing and how they set you up for failure your whole life, but you're, so you've surpassed that and you're doing freaking awesome now. So... You know, I know you don't want to hold any hate or a grudge towards them because you're a Christian and you want to do the right thing. But, I mean, I don't know how you how you do that. But what would you say to them right now? Um, I think the main thing I'd say to my biological mom is that I accept that the drugs are more important than me. And I accept that. And I do love her. But, um, and I forgive her, you know what I mean? I, I genuinely, I do now. I don't feel that void that I used to feel anymore. Um, and I would just say that, like, she missed out on something really great. But I am grateful for her because in many ways she made me the strong person that I am today because I didn't want to be like her. Mm -hmm. And to my biological father, I would just say, like, it'd be nice to give him a hug. <laughs> really? Yeah, it would be nice to hug him and just meet him and shake his hand. And, um, you know, I don't know if he'll ever see this video. and I hope that maybe one day he does. But, yeah, that's all I want. I just I want to know about his family and where he comes from. And, you know, I, um, I was very harsh to him a couple of years ago when I finally did get contact with him. And I was really young and I kind of felt rejected too then, you know. So I would just say that... <laughs> You know, I'm human, and I just, yeah, I would just like to meet him <laughs> and give him yeah. a hug. That's about it. I um, I don't really hold any animosity against him or anger. Um, 
Now the rest of them, well, <laughs> the rest of them, mm. <laughs> yeah. you know, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, uh, with all the crap that you've been through, I can only imagine how difficult it would be to forgive somebody who, who did that crap to you. I have a story like that. Like, I was molested when I was a child also by a uh, kid who was, I say kid, he was a kid. He was 16 and I was 13. And he was like, come over to my house. We'll have a spend a night party. And I was like, okay. I was young, you know. And uh, he set up a tent in his room and he was like, Hey, we're gonna go. We're gonna go stay in the tent tonight. And I was like, okay, cool. You know, I was young, and he's like, hey, uh, take off your clothes. And I did. I didn't know. He's like, all right, do this. And I was like, all right, and then do that. And then by the time the night was over, I had done anything you could think of, and I started feeling guilt and shame, and I knew it was wrong. And it took a while for me to come around and, you know, up until really this year, I, I, my family didn't know the full length of it. I kept it, you know, inside all those years. So I can relate to you on a very, very little note. Like what you went through was insane and uncalled for and it makes me just want to kill every single person that dude i'm sorry that you, you went through that yeah no um, no I, it's more common than people think like that's why i think it's like good that we're doing this we're talking about this because a lot of people don't want to talk about it but it, it it happens everywhere you're a much better person now if you had to see um your family you would wish them the best and you got a new career going. Yeah. I believe next year at this time, you're going to look back at your life and you're just going to say, wow. Good. God is good. God is really good. I wouldn't have made it out if it wasn't for him and all the people that he sent in my life that were a part of him. I'm proud of you. I know Mandy's proud of you. I know everybody in the family is proud of you. And, uh, you know, I never... I never really end podcasts like this, but I feel for some reason this is how we should end this one. I feel like we should end it through a prayer. Okay, yeah, okay? let's do it. All right. So, Lord, we just want to thank you. We want to thank you for everything you do for us. We want to thank you for Nadia, and uh, we want to thank you for just blessing her with this new career that she has going on and just giving her the strength to help forgive anybody else in her past that has done her wrong, Lord. We want to thank you for just creating a, a wonderful human being and always having your hand on her, Lord. And, you know, God, we want to, we want to thank you for just being alive and just for, you know, everything that we go through. We might not understand at the time, but we know it is for the greater good, Lord. And we want to ask you to everybody who's watching this video, if you could just simply, you know, come down and just touch their heart, Lord. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise Jesus. All right, Nadia. Good this job, is man. great. And uh, guys, we'll have another podcast. I hope you guys got some value out of this. If y'all have any questions yeah, or doubts to, to her, you can message her on Facebook. She's also, what's your, what's your Instagram? Uh, it's kind of, it's funny. It's not a damn business. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. If you want some in any business, come tell me all your business. <laughs> <laughs> so she's on Instagram. You're on TikTok as well. I'm on TikTok and I'm on uh, Facebook. But if you reach out to me on Facebook, it's shiny Lenore. Cause you know, we got to stay shiny. <laughs> stay shiny. And what is it on TikTok? Uh, it's just Nadia okay. Smith. Nadia Smith on TikTok. All right, Nadia. Well, thanks for coming on. We appreciate it. Right, a lot of value here. Me. Yep, absolutely. Guys, we'll see you on the next video. Thank